So the Game Boy Mega Machine, what a saga this has turned out to be. So I figured I should start this video with a little bit of a recap because we haven't done that before. Way back in episode one, I started talking about the prototype I'd been working on and the big, rather grandiose idea with the pie in the sky idea of having it done in six months. Granted, I had been planning this a couple of months beforehand. Episode two, it was starting to look like the Game Boy Mega Machine because I had a four panels of Game Boys done and four CPU modulators. So it was kind of just continuing the testing and kind of proof of concept. Episode 3 was about making the nice new cases. Sim was around so he gave me a hand with the woodwork and yeah they look so fresh and new back then. By the time episode 4 came around eight Game Boys were finished and eight of the column controllers were finished so I figured it would only be right to play Tetris eight times at the same time. Amazingly enough a few of the games actually synced up. After episode 4 there was a slight pause. It, I started to lose energy on the project and I felt like I needed to just put it aside for a little bit and then bring it back again but it's fine I came back with episode 5 and a whole case of Game Boys were well in the case and it was at that point when it was starting to sound like what it was sort of supposed to start sounding like <laughs> During the six month sort of hiatus from the Game Boy Mega Machine, I was still working on it on and off. Uh, I was making the VCA bus boards. This was a hundred VCAs that were basically gonna control where the Game Boy signals were gonna go. So episode six, got that finished and got that wired in and it was sounding pretty damn cool. Episode 7, boom, it became polyphonic. Finally, with Yuha's code, it was starting to sound like a proper polyphonic synth. We were trying it out with different voices, every row becoming its own polyphonic synth voice. <laughs> Episode 8, I got around to wiring the other aspect of the bus board into the Game Boys. That was the thing that was controlling the backlights being on and off, which meant that we could turn the whole set of Game Boys into a screen, kind of doing fancy patterns and stuff. In episode 9, we started looking at the patch matrix idea. This was the part of the machine that was going to be able to let us route the filters, the VCAs and stuff to wherever we wanted in the machine. By this 8x8 switch matrix, which a kind patron by the name of Frederick uh, helped out on the code. In episode 10 we tested out Frederick's Game Boy Mini Machine. This was a mini version of it to be able to test the animations that were running through the Game Boy. And then I played through submissions of Game Boy animations and stuff into the Game Boy and it, it's damn it, it was cool. It was cool. Episode 11 we saw the introduction of the analog filters. This was quite a lot of building. It was a lot of soldering and it was very over designed. At the point it sounded cool but it didn't 100% work correctly. It works correctly now but it it took a little bit of fiddling. By the time episode 12 came around, I managed to track down 40 copies of Game Boy Blue. So I played 40 copies of Game Boy Blue at the same time on the Game Boy Mega Machine. Amazingly enough, a few of the games stayed in sync for a good five to 10 minutes, which is quite amazing. And it was quite an experience to try them all out being played at once with the master controller. And then alas, the whole world went completely bonkers. The Pokemon Blue video was the last video that I shot in that workshop. It was a room in the back of an MOT car garage. And I ended up spending the next four months or so in a cave in the back of a basement flat that I was living at at the time. It was quite lucky that it was on the tail end of springtime going into summer, so there was no real damp issues in that cave, uh, or all of my stuff would have ended up all being rusty and sorry. <laughs> at this time, the Game Boy Mega Machine was sadly in storage so I couldn't do any work on it and then work was delayed yet again because I was getting the museum ready to get open so people could come and look around it if, if kind of thinking in hindsight it's probably absolutely the worst time to set up a museum ever <laughs> so the Game Boy Mega Machine finally had a home and the best thing about this is it could be seen by people and touched by people and played by people which is which is great However, it, it, it's not done. <laughs> this brings it forward another six months or so where we start looking at putting new screens on the Game Boy Mega Machine. This is because most of the Game Boys I bought from Deadpan Electronics, they were B-stocks, and they all had a few little problems here and there on the screens and stuff. Mix that in with the limited viewing angle of original Game Boys with backlight modifications. It made it very hard to see what was going on on the Game Boy screen, so I decided to upgrade all of the screens. And that was a big job, and there were a few problems, but luckily by episode four, 
14, these problems were all ironed out and they were all looking pretty, pretty snazzy. And the backlights from the old Game Boy screens, they were put inside the Game Boy so they'd illuminate the whole Game Boys instead of the, just the screen. So it looked really funky. In episode 15, I finally finished the filter controllers. These took a couple of months to design and make, but ultimately it means that you can control the filters properly and polyphonically. And these controllers have separate cards on the back for each of the polyphonic synth voices. And finally, after the lockdown was finished, the museum could open and people could see the Game Boy Mega Machine in the flesh. However, sadly, at the first few weeks or so, it wasn't actually doing any noises or anything. You could just see it flashing and you could twist a knob or something. And that brings us to episode 16. This is when the Game Boy Mega Machine games some uh, Leslie speaker rotating cabinets at the bottom. These are really cool. They're original style Leslie speaker drums that are spinning out on top of speakers and it makes a really nice effect. So it means you can choose between the nice and crisp and direct and kind of panny sort of, um, you know, direct signal of a Game Boy Mega Machine or you can send it out through both of these. This also meant for a good few months people could use and play the Game Boy Mega Machine in the museum and a lot of people did. However, you know, it's, it's a little bit uh, tough to get your head around and actually make sound good because there's a lot of knobs and it's uh, it's very idiosyncratic and that brings us up to now it's been quite a big journey let's go over to the museum and see what else has changed on the Game Boy Mega Machine so since the museum's closed for the winter for a rearrange well there's been a Bit, a few updates here and there so far on the Game Boy Mega Machine, but the main aim is for by the time it opens again, where well, it will be done. It will be done. Number one, we have a keyboard. Ooh! We have speaker grills on the front of the Leslie speakers. Oh yeah! But the stereo Leslie speakers actually emphasized a bit of a problem with the design of the Game Boy Mega Machine. Up to now, there's only been a single filter per row of Game Boys. That means when you adjust it here, you can only control one filter on each of the voices. This unfortunately acts like a bit of a bottleneck. That's because this, which is the routing matrix, which means we can pan from left to right on every single Game Boy if we wanted to. Well, that goes straight into a single mono filter. So the first thing that I did was I actually modified the filters to become stereo filters. So that means when I adjust this, you can see that it's actually controlling each set of filters. So what that means is bus one of every single Game Boy and bus two of every single Game Boy can actually be sent by the patching matrix, bus one over to filter one, and then bus two over to filter two. That means we can send them into two separate filters. And then if we send filter one into output one, that goes out output one and filter two into output two. That means we can send these two to two separate speakers. And that means we can have all of the panning of this routing matrix going through into two separate filters into two separate speakers. And that's what you were hearing in last week's video. Here's a little excerpt on that. If you listen to it in stereo speakers, you'll notice that the sound is panning between uh, both sides of your head. <laughs> That's because it's got two sets of filters, one left and one right. Lovely. This is not exactly what I originally intended with these filters, but it didn't actually need nearly any modification. The only difference is both of these filters are now coupled together to a single knob, so you can control them like a stereo filter, basically. The only modification I needed to do was extend the length of the ribbon cable coming from the back of the filter controller so it went to every single one of these instead of just these three. So it was that easy. But the other thing you would have heard in that video last week was you were able to offset each of the filters so you can control the filters separately anyway, which means you can bounce between your ears with a woom woom. <laughs> Another thing that I've put together is this, it's the modulation station for the Game Boy Mega Machine. It's basically four of the 1154 LFOs, which are based on the Electric Druid VC LFO 10 chip, which is a really cool LFO chip. They've got CV parameters over level, speed, wave shape, this, that, and the other, and you get inverted output. So you can have a positive and a negative output from the same LFO. And then at the end of all of these four LFOs, you get mix outs, which is mixtures of everything that's going on here. And you can get some truly crazy noises with literally just this thing on its own. Thank you. 
This thing took a fair while to put together and design purely because it is quite a big and chunky mama of a circuit board design assembly. I haven't put these up on the shop, but if you're interested in one of these because it is a little bit overkill, then please get in contact. But what this is mainly for is to add loads of modulation options to the Game Boy Mega Machine just to kind of liven it up. The first thing that I did was wire this into the bus modulation matrix, which means that you could cross fade and bounce between uh, audio going between the left and right channels. Uh, before before or after the filters. And so the positive of the LFO is wired into the bus one and then the inverted version is wired into bus two. So that means when we turn up this LFO, they'll actually start crossfading, bouncing between each other and it looks like this. The, this wire is wired into the switch of this, this wire is wired into the switch of this, and then this one is wired into the switch of this. What that means is when I plug this in, well, that's going to break the connection and all of these are going to stop being affected. Wait, watch it. On this one to break. Just plug that in. Plug this into that one. Well, these next ones are doing a different panning sequence to the others. So these new additions have taken a little bit of a while, hence why there's been a little bit of a pause between the last Mega Machine update and now. The thing about the Game Boy Mega Machine is I'm very glad that I didn't finish it all in the six months to start with when I was planning because I've learned so much as time has gone on and if I did it all then I don't think it would be uh, would have been as good as it would be if I you know used it treated it as a bit of a slow burner project however now I am about to say something and sound like a broken record saying it's going to be done by the time the museum opens for next year so oh uh, yeah maybe 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 that's not possible we'll see it'll be a lot more done anyway so what is the next step on the Game Boy Mega Machine well actually I am going to take another step backwards I'm going to be redesigning the filters. Basically the problem is, is now I've got stereo filters, they take up quite a lot of space. What I need to do is I basically need to redesign it so these two boards end up becoming one whole board. In fact, I'm actually deciding whether to make a whole set of two filters and the routing controls for that filter all on one single board. So that means we'll have a stereo filter behind this. What that means then is we can actually have two sets of stereo filters. Yes, that means that we will have four filters per Game Boy row, which means 24 filters in the whole Game Boy Mega Machine. However, by then, I think it will be well worth it because, for example, then we can have a stereo high pass and a stereo low pass, for instance, for every Game Boy row. That would be pretty awesome. But also, thanks to the design of the routing matrix, well, you can route a filter into itself. Sounds pretty funky. We'll look at that in the next video. Or you can even route this filter into the next filter, into the next filter, into the next filter, which in essence increases the slope on the filter, which uh, adds a whole lot more kind of adjustment of possibilities and stuff. However, by then, you'll only have a mono filter, but you'll have it twice the amount of slopes if that makes sense, if you know what filters do and stuff. If you don't know about that yet, fear not, there is a series coming up on the museum channel about the Foreman DIY synthesizer, and we're gonna to be touching on that in this, in this one right here. Mm. And after we've compressed the size and then also increased in number the filters, we're gonna then jump to the VCAs and then we're sort of done. Oh yeah, actually there's one more thing after that and that is the uh, program ROM controller where we can actually select between different programs on the Game Boy cartridges via the front panel. That's gonna be pretty cool. And then after that, fingers crossed, I think it should be nearly done. Oh, oh there's always other things. And then we've got to actually finish the top three rows of Game Boys because right now it's only three voices. So we've got to make make all of that work. Oh my God. 
there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work. Anyway, that's it for this update on the Game Boy Mega Machine. I've got a new song coming out in about seven days. Woo! And also, if you want to see more frequent and technical kind of looks at the Game Boy Mega Machine, there are vlogs and live streams and stuff like that. You can watch back over on Patreon, and I'll be updating more as time goes on on that project, amongst loads of others, and also downloads of sound packs from these and this, that, and the other. So if you want to support these projects and videos, then go and check out over there. Anyway, I've been Luke Mum No Computer, and yeah, don't be scared to try it. Maybe don't spend nearly three years trying to build a synthesizer out of a load of Game Boys. Maybe, 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 maybe don't do that. But you can if you want. I'm not stopping you.